Continuing on with some educational choices that can help your kids, Krista Kafer here from the Independence Institute. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a gala, it's wonderful. All right, you've been working on a project about blended learning. I gotta tell you, I have no idea what this title means, blended learning, so help, help me out. I remember going to school. I remember the nun up front. She had the nunchucks, she had everything, and she ran the classroom. We all learned the same thing at the same time, and, and, and she'd bludgeon the people who, who fell, fell behind. Isn't that the way every class should be? Well, I can see how well it worked out for yeah, you. <laughs> it done good for me. It done real good for me. It what? leaves a lot of kids behind. I mean, it works for some kids and leaves others behind. There's also kids that want to move forward and they can't, they get bored. So the question is, how can we remodel education so that those that need help can get it in real time and those who need something extra, they need to move forward in the curriculum, they're bored, they can move forward. How do you serve you know, 25, 30 kids in a classroom with just one teacher? The way you can do that is by blending in technology. Oh, you're one of those. You think technology helps. All right, but let's think, we all know the, that standard class. In that standard class, in, in the Catholic school, there were 35 kids in the class. You know, now there's 25 kids in the class, and that's, that's terrific because you want to have more individualized attention. But there were some smarter kids in that class of mine uh, in Catholic school, and, and they worked at a different level. I, I was the one that they needed to spend more time with. And so I, I, I get the idea. You really have to run a classroom towards the lowest denominator, or what we call the Caldera factor. You have to, you have to, you have to run a classroom by that, because otherwise you're leaving kids behind, but at the same time, it's not really fair to people on the other side. Exactly, so you get the kids that are sort of doodling and, and staring out the window because they want to move forward and they can't. So what if we brought in some computers and we had kids work at the computer, move as far along as they need to, kids that need to stop and get help, they can work with the teacher, or maybe we move them in a rotation so that at some point the whole class is working online, and maybe there's some automatic assessments in there that say, hey, this kid's really struggling, this kid does need help, or hey, this kid's doing really great, they're gonna move on. How does how this different from homeschoolers now try some other things, and there's, there's, there's online education, some people use at homeschool, use a program, some use an online education from, they go to the government school, they, they hook up with a program, and they're, they're at home, or they're in some learning center, and they're online, and they're, they're doing it purely online. How's that different from just being on an online class? Well, we've got uh, a lot of the innovations that come out of the online world. For the last 10 years or more, they've been piloting some of these great curriculum packages, assessments, tools, interventions, and, and in this case, like you said, these kids are at home or maybe they're at a center and they're working completely online. Well, they figured out in some of the online schools like Boulder Universal or like Falcon Virtual Academy that some of these kids could use some face-to-face -face attention. So maybe one day a week they come in and they work with teachers or they come in and work with their classmates. Maybe they do a project or something. And so they're blending in face-to-face -face instruction with online. And then they came upon this idea and thought, you know what? What if we were to take face-to-face -face instruction and blend in some computer time? So we've got a number of schools in the state of Colorado that are taking the computer, whether it's a computer lab or computers in the classroom, or maybe the kid's like listening to a lecture at home and then coming in the next day and doing a lab. That's called a flipped classroom. So we have these different models where there's blending in of computers into face-to-face -face instruction. And on the other side where there's online kids, they're blending in face-to-face -in -face instruction into that, that online environment. I remember my mother telling me when she was a kid, was a little farm community, and it was an immigrant town basically, and they all went to the same one-room classroom, all right? And so they had first through eighth grade in one room. So obviously back then they were able to stylize different different assignments, different teaching for, for all these kids because obviously they're not winning the same doing the same thing. It's not it's kind of a variation on that, isn't it? Except that you're in the same grade, but different kids can go at different speeds or spend more time on those areas that they need help on before they they move on. Exactly, so you get a lot more differentiation. The teacher is able to work with individual kids at different times or in small groups. If they do a rotational model, for example, they may have kids working in small groups with a paraprofessional or a teaching fellow. Meanwhile, a couple of kids are working in a group online. Another group is working directly with the teacher. And then after maybe 45 minutes, they, they move forward 
and then different groups work in different modalities. But it's a way of, of helping kids get the tools they need either to move forward, past the class, or maybe they need to be able to catch up. It really is about differentiation. And it's also about being able to automate some of those things that right now teachers spend a lot of time on, whether it's assessment or pulling together the assessment analysis or even attendance things that take a, a teacher's time, we eliminate those by having the computer do that and then have the teacher do the real stuff, which is working with kids one-on-one -on -one or in groups. Kids will never, they can't handle computers. They don't know what they're doing. Have you ever had the pile of remote controls and you've got to find the youngest person in the house to, to get them? So I would imagine they're comfortable with this as well. Has it been tried? It, Where? it has. It has been tried. It's, it's actually in a couple of schools in Colorado, and I tell you, the kids are very enthusiastic. Like you said, if you if you're having a problem with your smartphone, hand it to your three-year-old, yeah. and they will figure it out for you. Kids are growing up with with technology that we never had, and so they're excited about this, and it's it is being implemented. So we've got a couple of schools in Denver: Grant Beacon Middle School, University Prep, Rocky Mountain Prep and Odyssey School are all doing what's called a rotational model. We have a new school opening up in Brighton called Bolt, and they're gonna have a flex model so that kids are in a lab part of the day and they're in front of a teacher part of the day. Then we've got a, a, a number of uh, districts that are doing doing uh, student selected classes. So the kids are, are at home, or sorry, at, uh, at school learning like everybody else, but when they go home, they'll select a couple of classes that they actually learn online at home. And then we've got the uh, the enhanced virtual method whereby virtual kids, these online kids that you brought up, are actually getting some face-to-face -face time maybe once a week or once a month at a, at a center. All right, and you're not talking about, are these private schools that are trying these? Or no, are these, these, these are all public schools. These are all public schools. They're trying these, these new, new approaches. Parents liking it? Parents like it. And I tell you, it's Why? not just a front range thing. Most of the schools I just named off are front range, but Woodland Park High School down in Woodland Park near Colorado Springs, nestled in the mountains, they're doing a rotational model called the flipped model. I mean, it's something that can be done rural, it can be done in big districts, little districts, big schools, little, dis little schools, and kids do like it. Why aren't we doing more then? Why isn't, when, when it comes to technology, I'm always amazed how quickly the, you know, in the private world, it just, it, it happens. When, when was the last time you called up a travel agent to help you uh, with a flight? You know, you, you take care of that. Why is it, this is, this is not everywhere? Is, well, there, is there a roadblock? I think there's a couple of roadblocks that would keep it from, blend, from, from, from happening faster. Um, I also think it's a question of it being emerging best practices. And the fact that we really do want schools to do this well. I mean, just kind of throwing some kids in a room with computers, that's not going to do it. You've got to plan these programs really, really well. You've got to ask yourself a lot of critical questions about costs, about benefits, about having the right teachers, the right teacher training, to have the right programs, and it can be expensive. So the question is putting, you know, putting together the right plan for the right school for the right students and, and, and tapping into those emerging practices that are being identified by entities like the Independence Institute or Donald Kay, where teachers and administrators can learn what's being done and then do it well. And then there's some roadblocks at the legislative level as well. What, talk to me about that part. The, you know, parents might, it's hard to move schools and school districts but the legislature is very responsive to what constituents want because they're up for election every other year. What is it that you'd be looking for from, a, from the state legislature? Well, what I would like to see them consider is having a funding structure whereby courses are funded directly. Right now, if a, let's say you've got a school that's going, or a district that's going to allow students to, to take some classes online and uh, the, the district decides what online entities can be used and there may be some other ones out there that they don't let the, the families choose and then they may just pay a little bit of a fee to the provider to say okay you no know, you provided this class here's your fee and it may not really be enough to, to cover the cost and it also eliminates a lot of options for families who might want to choose a different online provider we're, we're hoping that we can move to a model where the state has a list of providers that have been vetted, that do a great job, and then the funding goes directly to those providers. And it can go in two stages, once when the kid enrolls and once when the, when the kid completes the program satisfactorily. The fact is, is that we do have some online providers that you know, may have collected the enrollment fee, but then the kid doesn't actually you know, finish the program. So in order to have so accountability, words, you divide the payment. I'll put, I'll put half down, but when my kid gets smart, I'll pay you the rest. Exactly. Exactly. Right. How are teachers handling this? Because I, you know, I go back to the old nun, and she she talked she talked to us. We listened, 
I think that would be pretty, pretty straightforward. Now you're going to need to have a teacher who can quickly move from this kid is working on this to that kid is working on this. This one's still stuck here and needs more extra help. What do we expect from teachers now? Well, what's neat is that some of these programs provide kind of like a, a student dashboard. They, they'll show the class, here's where the class is, here's where individual students are, here's what they need, here's what they can move forward on. So these, these, these systems are providing real-time information, not just in reports, but up on the screen. So a, stu or a teacher may walk past a student, see that on the screen that the, stu the student's been struggling with a particular concept for, say, three minutes. And the teacher knows, hey, I need to stop and say, you know, hey there, are, how, how are you doing on this particular thing? Can I help you? So it's providing real-time information to help them help the students. So in, instead of it being one way, the computer teaches the kid, it's actually more two-way because it checks to see how the kid's doing, where he or she is, and gives feedback to the teacher. So the teacher goes, Susie's not doing so well on her multiplication tables. We need, we need to focus in on that. So Susie, let's sit down and, and chat. So it, it, it exactly. gives them direction as to where we, need, where we need to look. It's giving information to the kid. It's giving information to the, the teacher. And the teacher's able to stop everything and say, you know, hey, let's work one-on-one. -on -one. Or, you know, little John Caldera and Susie, they're both struggling with fractions. Let's pull them into a small group and I'll help them together. How'd you know about the fractions? <laughs> the, are there other states that do this better than Colorado? I mean, it seems like we've got lots of great examples of blending learning here, but is, is, there, is there a model that you'd go, man, if we could do it like that state does or that city does? Well, we've got a couple of states like Texas and others that are starting to put together some of these these, uh, th they're starting to adopt le legislation that will allow the funding to go directly to the online provider that breaks up the funding so you get some funding at enrollment and some, fu some funding at completion and that are giving kids a much wider range of providers to choose from. So it's not just what the district says, it's the state that says, hey, here's your 20 providers. You can choose any one of these and we'll pay them directly. Now, does, are you saying the parent chooses that or does the, the teacher have some input on that or, or do the school? How do you know you're choosing the right program for your kid? Well, it depends on the model. So a couple of the models that I've described, like for the, the, the individual Colorado schools that I described, they're doing something in the classroom. It's not something that the parent picks per se, but when they choose that school, they know they've chosen a school with a rotational model. And so the teacher, the student, they work on it in the classroom. Then there's also the flex model, which is like Bolt Academy in, in Brighton, where the child spends half the time online and half the time in the classroom. But these other two models where it's the, the online academy where they get some face-to-face -face interaction or where students are self-selecting classes in addition to their regular school day, that's where you're dealing with other providers. Tight on time. So if someone is watching this right now and go, my, I want my kid doing that, where do they go? What do they do? Well, first I would check the Independence Institute's webpage and take a look at that paper. Read through that paper and see this exactly what paper. I'm talking about. What's the title of it? It's the Rise of Blended Learning in Colorado. It's a great place to start. It's a great paper. It's the most amazing it's a great place paper to start. ever. <laughs> right. The Rise of Blending Learning. Go to independenceinstitute.org and, and, and check it out. Exactly. And then after that, you do what? Then go to I your would school board would, and say, I want this. I would talk to your individual teachers and, and, and the principal and say, hey, what's going on at our school? Krista Kafer, thank you. Thank you. Listen for KHOW Radio. I'd love to spend some time with you. Check out independenceinstitute.org, and we'll see you next week.